characters. I'm excited to talk about the Traits and Reproduction Unit launch video, and without further ado, let's dive right in. Before we begin, I'd love to introduce myself. My name is Liam. I teach 7th and 8th grade science in Boston, Massachusetts. Now, before you begin this unit launch video, make sure that you've read and annotated the unit overview, unit at a glance, and standards. Make sure that you've read and annotated with the science background knowledge. And make sure you've printed out the unit internalization guide. You have a pen or pencil, and you are ready to go. Now, before we begin, I'd love to explain to you why this unit matters. So the Traits and Reproduction Unit helps us and our kiddos understand why there are differences and similarities among people, right? Your kids might be asking themselves, why do people say I act like my dad, but I look more like my mom? By the end of this unit, your kiddos should be able to answer that question. Additionally, it helps us explain why some diseases like diabetes or cancer are hereditary. Throughout this unit, kids are going to be trying to answer this big unit question. Why do Darwin's bark spider offspring have different silk flexibility traits even though they have the same parents? Let's find out why. Diving into our chapters. In chapter 1, kiddos try to answer this question. How do traits vary? Why do they vary even between parents and offspring and among siblings? In chapter one, students will take their pre-unit assessment, and then in lesson 1.2, they will begin their roles as genetic researchers. They'll receive an email asking your students to try to figure out why there's a variation between the silk flexibility trait, because doctors are trying to use this silk to create things like stitches if someone is injured. It's a really, really cool concept that's going to invest and engage your kids right away. And if the storyline doesn't already invest them, I promise you this simulation will. This simulation is so cool where kids will actually be investigating different spiders with different genetic traits. If they click on a spider, you can then see here on the left um, and then on the right that you are able to then look at a microscopic level of what's happening within each cell of this spider so that kids can really see what causes the, gene the genetic makeup that we know about these spiders and that we know about ourselves and the people around us. <clears throat> at the end of this chapter, students will be given the question, why do you traits for silk flexibility flexibility vary within this family of Darwin spiders, and they'll be given three different claims that they're going to have to investigate and eliminate throughout this unit. These are the key concepts that students should know by the end of chapter one. Take a moment to read over them, and then press continue when you are ready. At the end of this, un of this chapter, Students should know that the traits of an organism are, deter are determined by the structure of protein molecules and their interactions of those protein molecules in cells. This is the chapter one focus test that your students will be taking at the end of this chapter. Take a moment now to complete this on your own. When you're ready, you can press play and check your answers with our exemplar and our rubric on the next slide. This is an example of an exemplar for our chapter one task. Take a moment to look over it with part one, the modeling, and then part two, the written response. In chapter two, students will be answering the question, why do Darwin's bark spiders make different proteins for silk flexibility? In chapter two, students will learn that claim three was one that they could eliminate and now they're grappling between these two different claims in chapter two. Claim one states that genes provide instructions and build proteins. Claim two says that genes provide instructions for making proteins, but they do not build proteins themselves. Throughout chapter two, students will be grappling between these two claims and doing different activities that will help them determine which claim is actually accurate. 
also in chapter two, students will be introduced to the concept of mutations. They will watch a video about a cat that has short ears, which is different from um, other cats in its family. And the uh, video will also break down how different genotypes work. These are the key concepts that students will be learning in chapter two. Take a moment to read through the first two, and there are two more on the next slide. These are the other two key concepts that students will know. It's very important for students to understand the difference between homozygous and heterozygous uh, gene types, so please do not hesitate on taking time to make sure students have mastered these two different concepts, especially when they get into high school and they start looking at Punnett squares and the difference between dominant and receptive, recessive traits. Um, this will definitely help them further on, especially if they're considering a career in biology. By the end of chapter two, students should have learned that genes are instructions for producing proteins. This is an example of the chapter two focus tasks that your kiddos will be asked to complete by the end of this chapter. Take your time now to complete this on your own. You can press pause. When you're ready, press play to uh, check your answers to our exemplar on our rubric. Good luck. I know you got this. All right, these are our uh, exemplars for our rubric and for what we expect students to produce. Take this time now to check what you said. Make sure you understand how high the bar is set for our kids, the rigor with this task, and that you know what they need to do to make sure that they're able to exceed these goals. When you're ready, you may continue. All right, in chapter three, students are asked to answer this question. Why do the Darwin's bark spider offspring have different gene combinations even though they have the same parents? While trying to answer those questions, students will spend some time reading about why identical twins and twins are so rare. They'll also be able to read and understand the different methods scientists are using to clone prehistoric animals like mammoths, which is really cool. Um, and definitely ties into different current events that have been going on currently um, with scientists and archaeologists finding different fossils and looking to see if they could replicate those genes. This is where this unit really sparks those questions and kind of brings us out of the realm of just thinking about Darwin spiders, but how much genetics can affect us, our past, and even our future. These are the key concepts that kids should have learned by the end of this chapter. Take a moment to read through them. When you're ready, you may continue. And by the end of chapter three, uh, kiddos have learned that through sexual reproduction, an organism inherits a random combination of gene versions from its parents. So yes, we do get 50% of our genes from our mom and from our dad. However, the combination of those are random, and that's why there is variation uh, between organisms, between an organism and its parents, an organism and its siblings as well. Kiddos will start to realize about themselves and their own personal lives as well. This is an example of the chapter three focus task. Take a moment to complete this on your own. When you're ready, you may press play and check your work to the exemplar and the rubric. Okay, let's see how you did. Um, on the left is an example of the rubric. On the right is an example of an exemplar for the modeling part, and then for part two, the written response as well. Um, in the written response, claim three is supposed to be the correct answer, so make sure that uh, you read through why claim three is the correct answer and that you're able to uh, guide your kiddos to get to that conclusion as well. All right, in chapter four, uh, your students will now apply what they've learned in ch uh, chapters one, two, and three into a totally new scenario. 
In chapter four, students are going to meet an elite distance runner named Jackie, and we need to find out um, why she has this trait for elite distance running when no one else in her family does. Chapter four will start off with your kiddos looking at different evidence cards um, that explains the different traits that Jackie, her brother, and her uh, two parents have as well to help us determine why she possesses this trait, even though nobody else in her family does. This is an example of the chapter four tests that students will be completing um, after their science seminar and after they've discussed why Jackie is this elite distance runner, even though nobody else is. There is more than one possible answer. Um, you could choose claim one, claim two, or claim three. The focus here is really to think about the uh, evidence that is used to support that. So take a moment now to make your own stance, which claim do you agree with, write about it, and then you can check your responses on the next slide when you are ready. All right, so this is a rubric that you'll be using to assess all kiddos, regardless of which claim that they chose. Um, and then I'm going to show you the different examples for claim one, claim two, and claim three, depending on what you or your kiddos chose to explain why Jackie has this different trait. Here is an example if you chose claim one, which is that Jackie's trait is due to her training. Take a moment to read through this. If you chose claim two, Jackie has a different combination of gene versions. Jackie's trait can be explained by the combination of gene versions she inherited from her parents. Take a moment to look through this explanation. And then lastly, if you chose claim three, that Jackie has a mutation in her gene for the ACTN3 protein, this mutation instructs for a protein that results in the long distance running trait instead of a sprinting trait. You can read through the exemplar response for that as well. Okay, we are almost there. You have gone through chapters one, two, three, and four. We are briefly going to go over some different questions in the end of unit assessment, and then you will be ready to teach this unit to your students like a master. Let's dive right in. This is an, ex this is an example of a progress build one question. Take a moment to read through it, answer it on your own. When you're ready, you may press play and we'll move on to the next slide. Good luck, I know you got this. Okay, let's see what the answer is. Progress build one and the answer is, C, make sure that you are checking your answer with the progress build one concept so you can understand why C is the correct answer. I know you're a one for one. Let's see if we can go for two for two. Let's move on to progress build two. Here's an example of a progress build two question that kiddos will see in their end of unit assessment. Take a moment, go through this on your own. When you're ready, you can press play and move on to the next slide. Good luck. I know you got this. Let's do it. All right, progress bill two, and the answer is D. Make sure you reference the answer D with the progress bill two so that you understand. I know that you are two for two. You are going to be a progress bill three pro. Let's move on to that last and final progress build question. You got this. Here's an example of a progress build three question. Take a moment to answer it on your own, and then you can check your answer on the next slide. You got this, let's go. And the progress build three answer is A. Please make sure you're comparing your answer to the progress build three explanations so you know why that is correct. Lastly, now that you've mastered progress build one, two, and three questions, here's an example of what the constructed response is. The question is below. Take a moment to read that.
And here is an exemplar response for that constructive response. Make sure you read through that so you know exactly how high that bar is set for our kiddos and the amount of rigor that we're expecting to see in their written responses. Thank you teachers so much for taking the time to go through this video with me. Uh, you should now feel like a master about this unit, being able to pass on this knowledge to your kiddos. Thank you for the time that you've taken because this is only going to make your classroom stronger and your uh, kiddos' science experience even better. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Lastly, for KIPP teachers, please make sure that you finish taking the entire end of unit test, not just the questions that we went through in this video. Make sure that you complete your unit internalization guide. Make sure that you submit the unit Google form on kipsd.org. Please make sure you calendar out your unit. Make sure that you prepare your vocabulary and anchor charts. Please make sure you organize your kit and materials. There are a lot of pieces to this, especially with the Connect, so make sure you're uh, familiar with what you need to do for each lesson. And then lastly, start prepping and rehearsal your lessons. Thank you so much for taking this time. This means a lot for uh, us and our kids, and they're just going to love, love, love this unit, and I know that you will too. Thank you so much.